On June 30th, 1908, a weather station in the United Kingdom detected abnormal fluctuations never before seen in atmospheric pressure. Meanwhile, far from there, the engineer of the Trans-Siberian Railway stopped his train when he noticed that both the wagons and the rails were vibrating. In the Russian city of Kensk, horses were knocked over by a shockwave, while houses trembled and objects on shelves fell and broke. Many seismic stations throughout Europe and Asia recorded a tremor of up to 5 degrees in the Richter scale. Trees were set on fire in an area of 2,000 square kilometers around the center of a suspected explosion. Then all windows broke, and everyone within a circle of 400 kilometers fell to the ground. For several days, the nights were so bright in parts of Russia and Europe that it was possible to read after sunset without the need of artificial light. The only testimonies of what happened, the Siberian nomadic population called Tungus, explained that they saw something in the sky that shone like the sun, which made it impossible to see directly, followed by an explosion, which made them think it was the end of the world. They described the explosion as a giant mushroom rising into the sky. The animals fled, the Tungus's tents, located more than 50 kilometers away, were blown away into the air. Hi, and welcome to S for Science, and this was the so-called Tunguska event, which took place in Russia many years ago. Curiously, it was not known exactly what had happened until 13 years after the explosion, a Russian geologist was able to go to the area to investigate. And the panorama he found was devastating. He found an area of total destruction 60 kilometers in diameter, filled with charred trees that were mysteriously arranged in a kind of circular pattern. Now, it is believed that most likely the cause of this catastrophe was a comet of about 80 meters in diameter, made of ice, that exploded just before touching the surface. The detonation, similar to that of a high-powered nuclear weapon, was equivalent to 25 megatons. But humans have created something much more powerful than this devastating explosion of cosmic origin. This is the SAR bomb, the largest explosion ever created by humans. This atomic bomb, which was twice as powerful as the Tunguska event, was detonated on October 30th, 1961 for scientific purposes, at an altitude of 4 kilometers above Nova Sembla, a Russian archipelago located in the Barents Sea, in the Arctic Ocean. When the bomb detonated, the temperature immediately below and around the detonation rose to millions of degrees Celsius. The pressure under the explosion was 211,000 kilos per square meter, or what is the same, 20 times the normal atmospheric pressure. The light energy was so powerful that it could be seen at a distance of a thousand kilometers. The shockwave was powerful enough to break thick glass even more than 900 kilometers from the explosion, and in space it was recorded revolving around the Earth three times. The mushroom cloud created by the explosion rose to an altitude of 64,000 kilometers. The thermal energy was so great that it could have caused third-degree burns to a person who was 100 kilometers from the explosion. In this comparative image of the city of Paris, the red circle represents the area that had total destruction, and the yellow, that of the fireball. In this other one, you can see a comparison of the explosion of the SAR bomb with the Hiroshima bomb. At the time of the explosion, the bomb irradiated 1.38% of the total power irradiated by the sun. It released 210 petajoules of energy, which is the same as 10 times the energy consumed by Mongolia in one year. The fact that we have been able to generate such enormous amounts of energy leads me to ask myself the following question. How powerful can human beings become? In 2012, the total world energy consumption was 553 exajoules. If this amount was equivalent to one red blood cell, we could say that the sun produces the same amount of red blood cells in your body in one year. So, in other words, in one year, we consume 0. Point followed by 12 zeros, 4% of the energy that the sun produces in a year. But what would happen if we could take advantage of all this energy? Well, that we would become a type 2 civilization on the Kardashev scale. But what is this scale? Well, it's a method used by the SETI scientists proposed in 1964 by the astrophysicist Nikolai Kardashev to measure the degree of technological evolution of a civilization. This scale has three categories, called type 1, type 2, and type 3. And to classify civilizations, what it does is determine how much energy those civilizations have available to take advantage of. This amount of energy increases exponentially and directly determines how powerful a civilization is. The first thing one wonders when learning about 
the existence of this method of classifying is in what category is human civilization. Well, in order to classify ourselves, we must understand how this scale works. It's very simple. All it does is determine the category based on the order of magnitude of the electrical power that a civilization has. Power is a measure of energy transfer over time, and it's expressed in watts, which is equivalent to joules per second. Before, we said that some years ago, the total world consumption was 553 exajoules. This is equivalent to a power of about 17.54 terawatts. A lot, you'll think. Well, this puts us at 0.7 on the Kardashev scale. We didn't even get to type 1. But what do each of these three types that this scale has mean? Let's start with the first one. A type 1 civilization is a civilization that is capable of harvesting all the available power on a single planet. Approximately 10 to the 16th power watts. Let us now remember nuclear fusion energy, a promising method of obtaining energy that is still under development, but which will allow, if it's possible to carry out, to produce enormous amounts of energy consuming only water. Nuclear fusion is the only long-term viable energy source for humans, so its development is key in our near future. In fact, with just 280 kilograms per second of water, we could generate enough energy to be a type 1 civilization, and using only water, without having to use any other type of energy source. The water would last about 150 million years, which is more than twice as long as the dinosaurs when extinct. Enough time for us to become a type 2 civilization. Before becoming a type 2 civilization, Let's not forget that there is another method to be able to get enough power for us to be considered a type 1 civilization. And it is antimatter, which is found in the Van Allen belt, some areas of the Earth's magnetosphere. This antimatter could be collected and used to obtain energy, since with only one kilogram of it, an explosion similar to the star bomb, which weighed 27,000 kilograms, could be made. It is unknown how much antimatter there is around Earth but it is known that it is present on other planets of the solar system, especially Saturn, which is a mine of antimatter. Antimatter and matter, when they come into contact, release enormous amounts of energy. This is how energy is obtained from this substance, but at the same time, it is its biggest problem, since it makes it very difficult to collect, since when it comes into contact with matter, it explodes. If we could find a way to get this precious substance, the energy needs of a type 1 civilization would be more than covered. And inadvertently, we have already left the Type 1 civilization, since the fact of collecting resources on another planet would imply that we no longer be doing it on ours. So the collection of antimatter could be considered as a resource intermediate between Type 1 and Type 2 civilizations. Because Type 2 on the Kardashev scale is not described as a civilization capable of collecting antimatter, but as a civilization capable of taking advantage of all the energy produced by its star. Or what is the same, a civilization that had in its power about 4 times 10 to the power of 26 watts of electrical power. 4 times 10 to the 26 watts is a huge power hardly imaginable. Without going any further, with this amount of energy, 230 billion current civilizations could be sustained. Imagine the potential that civilization would have. For starters, nothing known to science could put an end to a civilization of this category. Let's imagine, for example, that an object the size of the moon entered our solar system on a collision course with the Earth. We could vaporize that object instantly. Or if we had enough time, we could change the orbit of our planet, thus dodging the object. And if we didn't want to move the Earth, we could move any other planet at will to make it act as a shield, for example, Jupiter. And moving planets would not only help us to avoid potential dangers, but, for example, it would help us bring Mars into a closer orbit to the Sun, thus making it more suitable for life. And let's not talk about the space travels that we could do. Going to Saturn for a honeymoon would be perfectly suitable. But how would you take advantage of all the energy available in a star like the Sun? Well, you simply have to build a Dyson Sphere. This is nothing more than a sphere that totally or partially covers the star, with solar panels inside, to capture its energy. The sphere would have a radius similar to that of a planetary orbit, and would not have to be a solid sphere. It could be in a form of a bubble or swarm. In fact, the model of the sphere would be difficult to build, for two main reasons. 
because so far no material is known to be so resistant as to prevent this structure from collapsing due to the gravity of the Sun, and because the amount of material necessary to build it would be too big. That is why the models that are based on a set of independent solar collectors are the most viable. Dyson spheres are one of the main objectives of those people who are dedicated to searching for extraterrestrial civilizations. Set spheres would not let visible light escape, but they would nevertheless emit large amounts of infrared radiation due to the fact that the solar panels would heat up. But so far we have not found anything similar to them. Despite the fact that they would be quite peculiar objects in the sky due to the fact that they would only emit that type of radiation. Perhaps because such civilizations don't exist. Or because their level of scientific knowledge has allowed them to develop technologies for obtaining energy unimaginable for any human being. In any case, we have gone from a civilization capable of controlling all the energy of a planet to a civilization capable of controlling all the energy of its star, which makes this civilization immune to its destruction. But what happens if we keep going up? Well, that we arrive at a type 3 civilization. That is, a civilization capable of harvesting all the energy available in a galaxy. A species that reached this degree would be knowledgeable of everything that had to do with energy, making them the supreme species in their galaxy. The inhabitants of this galactic empire would have evolved over billions of years as a species, and if, for example, humans were to reach this point one day, they would be very different from us. They would most likely be cybernetic organisms, that is, half biological, half robot beings, since being able to take advantage of the enormous amounts of energy available would be something that natural selection would have favored. At this point, said civilization would have developed colonies of self-replicating robots, capable of colonizing stellar systems, to take advantage of their energy, building Dyson spheres, or other systems for obtaining energy in each one, creating a gigantic network that would carry the power to the main planet or base. How much energy would this type of civilization be able to harvest? Well, of a power of 4 by 10 to the 37th watts. This is an unimaginable number for any human being. Or it may not be so. Because quasars, the most violent phenomena in our universe, they have a power of 10 to the 40th watts, or what is the same, 100 times the energy of the entire Milky Way. Quasars are generated around supermassive black holes, from stars that are devoured by them. To create the brightness of a quasar, a black hole must swallow about 10 stars a year. These stars are enormously deformed when approaching the black hole, which causes an accretion disk to be created. That is, an area around the black hole absolutely full of matter rotating at high speeds. This accretion disk generates a very high friction, which together with the magnetic field of the black hole, causes a colossal jet of energy to be generated, as energetic as many galaxies put together. This is Quasar 3C273. It was the first quasar to be discovered, and it is about 2.4 billion light years away. If it were located at the enormous distance of 30 light years from our planet, which is about 7 times the distance between the Earth and Proxima Centauri, the closest star to us after the Sun, it would look to us as bright as the Sun. Simply spectacular. But let's not go away from supermassive black holes, because it is believed that possible Type 4 civilizations would live inside these objects in the universe and would be able to control the energy of the entire universe. And going to an even more hypothetical field, we can talk about Type 5 civilizations. Civilizations capable of controlling not only one universe, but all universes. This may seem like something impossible for our civilization to achieve. The theoretical physicist Michio Kaku suggests that humans could reach Type 1 in about 150 years, Type 2 in a few hundreds, and Type 3 in 100,000 to a million years. Thinking that human beings will be able to harness the energy of an entire star may seem impossible, but it is not, because there is a power that we have not mentioned in this video, which is ultimately the most important power. The power that if not considered could make any other power the greatest danger, and that power is common sense. Humans must be aware that in parallel to our development as a civilization, the power that we will have in our vast world will also develop. A power that will be of absolutely no use to us if we are not capable of managing it. If we want to advance as a civilization, we have to preserve our home, end the war, and continue supporting scientific research. Space is already hostile enough for us to be murdering each other. 
We are suspended in space, surrounded by miles and miles of emptiness, miles and miles of loneliness, miles and miles of death. We do not know of anyone else in the universe. We are an oasis of life in the midst of the dark and deadly void of space. We annihilate ourselves as if each living being were not a wonder of the universe. We must learn to live without having to kill. It is our commitment as the humanity that we call ourselves. Thank you very much for watching the video and goodbye.